Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference Breakout Session, Power of the Press, American Journalism and Media Informing the Public in the 21st Century. We are grateful to our sponsors, Nielsen, Viacom CBS, National Association of Broadcasters, and Microsoft. Our panel chair for today's session is Representative Joaquin Castro representing Texas's 20th Congressional District. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, as well as the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Education and Labor Committee. We also welcome Liliana Rañón, Vice President, External Affairs, National Association of Broadcasters, who will provide welcoming remarks. Our moderator for today's session is Luz Peña, a bilingual reporter at ABC7 News in San Francisco. Luz has won 11 Emmy Awards, an Excellence in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, and an LA Press Club Award. She was named one of the top 40 Latinos in American media by the Huffington Post. Please welcome our opening speaker, Representative Joaquin Castro. Hey, y'all, I'm Joaquin Costa, and I represent my hometown of San Antonio, Texas, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Welcome to the CHCI Leadership Conference. I'm proud to present this next panel, Power of the Press, American Journalism and Media Informing the Public in the 21st Century. Look, a free press is a cornerstone of democracy. And in the modern era of social media and misinformation, the role of the media is more important than ever. Holding the powerful accountable, seeking truth, highlighting injustice, and telling the people's story are important things that the press does. But today, there's also a missing Latino narrative in American society. Latinos are nearly 20% of the U.S. population, but we're mostly invisible from the image-defining and narrative-creating institutions of American society. For example, America's newsrooms don't reflect America's population. At the New York Times, the paper of record for our country, only 7% of staff are Latino. At the Washington Post, in our nation's capital, only 5% of employees are Latino. Even at the Los Angeles Times, in a city that's nearly 50% Latino, only 17% of reporters are Latinos. The lack of Latino representation in American media is a major problem. By and large, the American people don't know who Latinos are, where Latinos fit in the United States and its history, and the contributions of Latinos to our nation's prosperity. In other words, there is a missing Latino narrative in America. And this is not to take away from the wonderful work of journalists across the United States, but we cannot ignore the inequity and systemic exclusion of Latinos in media today. I've pushed hard with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus for newsrooms and media organizations to take this issue seriously. I've encouraged news executives to be transparent with their demographics, to set aspirational goals for the workforce to reflect our nation and to work hard to portray our community accurately. And I won't stop working on this issue, but it's gonna take all of us speaking out and demanding change. I hope this CHCI panel is an impactful conversation and please reach out if I can ever be helpful. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you Congressman Castro for leading today's conversation. And to CHCI President and CEO Marco Davis, Thank you so much for the long-standing partnership NAB and CHCI have had over the years. On behalf of the National Association of Broadcasters, welcome to the CHCI conference, and thank you for joining today's important conversation on the role that local journalism plays in informing and educating the public. I am Liliana Rañón, Vice President of External Affairs at NAB. As the voice of America's local radio and television stations and broadcast networks in our nation's capital, we know firsthand the vital role that broadcasters play in providing local, unbiased journalism. That is information that is respected by all Americans. From local news to emergency alerts, weather and traffic reports, Americans turn to their local anchors and journalists for timely, factual and trustworthy information. Even as the pandemic has caused many challenges and uncertainties this past year and a half, local journalists and anchors have been there to relay important community information. Serving as a primary source of community-focused information, especially that related to COVID, such as where to get tested, how to get a COVID vaccine, 
how to prepare for back to school for young children. This past year has also tested our democracy and the very pillars upon which it stands, including a free and diverse press, due in large part to the myths and disinformation that plagued social media. More and more Americans are losing trust in the information they receive. Fortunately, local broadcasters remain a touchstone of truth and are the most trusted source of information in the country. Broadcasters will always be there to deliver fact-based investigative journalism and to reassure, educate, and empower the public. I want to thank the CHCI for having this important conversation, and I look forward to the dialogue. Thanks again. Good afternoon, my name is Luz Peña. I'm a bilingual reporter at ABC News in San Francisco. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Congressman Castro, for the opening remarks and setting the tone for this conversation. And thank you to CHCI for hosting this thoughtful leadership conference and focusing attention on the role of American journalists and the work that we're doing here during a crucial moment in our nation's history. And of course, we're gonna look into the future of the press in a very increasing digital world that we're living on. Now, before we move on into our panel, I want this to be an interactive discussion. So I wanna invite you to be part of this by submitting your questions in the chat function or by submitting your thoughts or reactions and comments on social media using the hashtag CHCI HHM21. Now, I'm delighted to be joined by three experts on this topic. Stacey De Arma, Senior Vice President, Diverse Insights and Initiatives at Nielsen. Enrique Acevedo, Correspondent for 60 Minutes at CBS News. And Mary Snap, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives, Microsoft Corporate, External and Legal Affairs at Microsoft. Welcome, panelists, and thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to jump right in with my first question. How has journalism changed at a time when fewer than half of the Americans trust traditional forms of media and news? How do we adapt to that? Let's start with Enrique Acevedo. Well, thank you so much, Luz and Stacy. Mary, it's a pleasure to share this virtual stage with you. And, and thanks, of course, um, to everyone involved in, in, in getting this, this event done. I think it's incredibly important that, that we uh, do what Joaquin Castro, Representative Castro was saying uh, during his introductory remarks, that we fill this, this void, uh, this lack of the Latino narrative, um, and, and that we all try to do that by um, adding our perspectives and our experience in, in, in such diverse fields. So thanks again for having me. Um, well, you know, I think journalism has changed uh, in many ways uh, through technology. We have now social media, instant communications, a different ways of consuming media and uh, news and information at the top of that. Um, we have um, had to deal with a crisis of trust, of confidence in uh, news outlets, which is also something that's um, intensified, I think, uh, recently due to disinformation and misinformation. And we can get into the definition and the differences between those two terms. Um, yeah. I think uh, we're also changing demographically as a country, as a nation. Uh, and, and that certainly has an effect on the content, on, on the type of stories, um, the subjects, the people who get uh, the privilege of, of being, um, you know, profiled and, 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 and the people that, that we report on, uh, the issues that we also report on have been changing. Um, and, and, and all of that plays a role into into this transformation. Um, and you know, we can spend an entire panel, 45 minutes on each of those uh, components. Uh, but I think in, in general, that those are, those are the terms. And it's great that we have someone like Stacey and Mary here to understand how the audi audience has changed demographically, what that means, how technology plays a role into that. And I'll just be uh, the, the great for journalists for sharing a panel with incredibly talented and intelligent women. <laughs> Okay, let's go to Stacy. How do we adapt to this? You know, the ever-changing uh, traditional traditional forms of media that we're faced with today. Well, what we're finding that largely the community is doing, and in particular the Latino community, is really shifting to digital consumption of everything. So this is from content to audio, and certainly news and information. There is this uh, shift of content consumption and reliance. 
on uh, um, digital outlets, right? So think, and when I say that, what I mean specifically is I'm talking about social, but most specifically for the Latino community, a lot of news and information is passed through messaging apps and often encrypted apps. And so what happens, especially when we're talking uh, here today about um, truth and trust in journalism and the role of journalists uh, in, uh, in, in, in dispelling some of the information that's uh, that spread so widely is a lot of these apps are encrypted. And so what you end up finding is information that is transferred within these apps, between families, within the community, specifically about news and content, vaccines as an example, um, uh, is uh, because the content is encrypted, it really puts pressure on some of the more traditional fact checking, um, uh, fact checking um, capabilities. And so misinformation is rampant in our community more so than in others because we're so reliant on technology and on, uh, on, on digital communication through these apps with our families and, uh, you know, abroad and at home. And that really puts a lot of pressure and I think a good pressure on our local, uh, local news journalists to, to bring forward truth and trust in information that can combat what we sometimes almost can't see or can't necessarily reach. I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm thinking about the fact that the way that also journalism is changing now is that people have to sometimes pay to know, to know the news. You know, you have to pay a subscription for several uh, news wires as well. Not everyone has the access to do that. So I wanna toss it to Mary. What's the solution for this? Well, I think we are just in a rapidly changing time period with respect to how we think about news and journalism. And there, there's just no question that the pandemic has accelerated lots of digital trends. And journalism is another one. We, we heard from Representative Castro about the decline in local news. And we also know that the revenue model has changed drastically in the last 10 years. 90% of the advertising revenue has moved from newspapers, which you might view as very old school, has moved from newspapers onto digital platforms. So it is a time when media has to innovate in lots of different ways. One of them might be subscription. Let's hope there are lots of other ways in which the business model can change. We at Microsoft have followed this over the last six or seven years because we actually have a, a bit of a, we don't have a news business, but we have a publishing business with our MSN platform, Bing, and with our uh, browser. And over that period of time, we've had essentially about 1,200 publishers and 4,500 media brands. So we've seen what's been happening first time or firsthand. It is time for innovation in the news business. That might be public private partnerships. That might be different sorts of things like the local journalism sustainability act that's going forward in Congress today. But there is no question that we need to change the business model. It doesn't have to go to subscriber models and, and walled gardens. And, you know, those come with their own sets of issues. But we clearly need innovation in the business model. We've been trying to do a few things with pilot communities in five places, uh, Fresno and El Paso Juarez, as well as Yakima and a couple of others too, where we've brought the community together to engage with the Community Foundation, some resources from Microsoft to really work on understanding how local news can innovate and change over time with the support from the community. So I'd love to talk about that more as we get into the conversation. I love that. Thank you, Mary. So let's bring it in into something that's happening today. I'm sure you guys have all seen this on social media, watched it in the news about the situation at the border. Um, Enrique actually uh, posted something on Instagram. He posted photos of what's taking place, but he didn't post the photos that we're seeing, the ones of the, uh, the, the border agents. And he actually posted, posted a saying this, as news consumers, we have the power to decide which content we share with others. That choice helps build a larger narrative that often shapes public opinion and even policy. Why do you think your message was showing these photos? You know, they're different than the ones that we're seeing on other news outlets. Um, and thanks for that question, Luz. Well, I think, uh, you know, it speaks to a lot of the issues that, that we're discussing right now. Um, this, this innovation that Mary was referring to in, in the business model, in the way we use technology should also be part of a, a transfer editorial transformation uh, for, for journalists and newsrooms. Uh, we need to think of new ways of connecting with the audiences. And that um, and that's what I was trying to, to, to say with, with that post. 
I just don't think that uh, the job of journalists today is to post a picture uh, like, like the one you were referring to and include a hashtag and say, this is unacceptable and, and this is everything that's wrong with our immigration system and that's it. I think that creates more confusion and more of that hyper polarization and division that we've been uh, you know, uh, in seeing increasingly in the past decade. I, I think that context and, and depth and nuance, that word that's often missing from, from um, journalism in general and our national dialogue, uh, it's, it's, it's badly needed. Um, so, you know, I think that by posting and sharing the, the, the incredible photos of uh, John Moore, a Getty photographer who spends a lot of time at the border, what I was trying to do is just build a different narrative, not the one that feeds uh, this idea, of this false notion of border hysteria, of chaos and violence, of, that denigrates the integrity of, of, of migrants and asylum seekers in many ways. Um, that justifies those nativist and nationalist movements, at least provides them with political clout and justifies the militarization and the grave human rights abuses that we've seen throughout the years. Uh, what I was trying to say is these are families. These are human beings. Uh, 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 you know, in, in essence, that's, that's what we're seeing at the border, a large movement of, of people who've been displaced by various reasons from you know, bad governance and, and natural um, disasters and, 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 you know, extreme poverty. And, and they're trying to get their, their children to a safer place. Uh, let's start the public dialogue out of, you know, using empathy and compassion instead of this righteous indignation. And, and, and that was just uh, what, I, what I was trying to do with that post. But again, it goes back to the fact that now as news consumers, we have to be more responsible in the way that we are getting the information and how we share that information. We're now responsible for that too. Uh, Stacy was referring uh, you know, to, to the challenges of fact-checking in this era of instant messaging. Yeah. I think we're all part of that effort of, of um, you know, fact-checking ourselves and, and making sure that what we're saying and what we're sharing is, is uh, accurate. And if I'm I can so add just a little. Yeah, go for it, Mary, go for it. No, I was just gonna say, you know, technology and this is new technology can be used either as a tool or a weapon. And I think Enrique is exactly right. We need to decide if we're going to use it as a tool for good or whether it's going to be weaponized and putting context around things is very important on the technology side, understanding content moderation and managing that for Microsoft and others in tech company, other tech companies, the Christchurch call a couple of years ago was a real awakening for us to say, you know, we compete every day, 24 hours a day, but in this particular area, we need to come together and stop this particular form of video forming of, of violence. So I think just keeping in mind that technology can be used for good or bad, and our goal is to use it for good. Well, if Stacey, I can just can you add. Talk about I was going to ask you, maybe you can shed some light on misinformation. You know, we're talking with Enrico, Enrique about social media and how everyone is just scrolling and people are really choosing who to believe. If they don't agree with yeah. something, if it pulls their heartstrings and they're going to believe that. But then the facts are the facts and the facts don't care about your emotions. So speak about misinformation, please. So I, I'm yeah. so glad you invited me to add to this because what uh, what I want, did you say Stacy or Mary? I'm sorry. I think you said Stacy. Stacy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so what I wanted to add, Mary, you are so right, and, and Enrique as well. So one of the things that Nielsen is doing in this space is really trying to size uh, the misinformation situation. So we, you know, this is something um, I, we believe that when, um, you know, content developers, outlets, and others really have a good handle on what the size of the misinformation situation is, uh, that we can work with those developers by providing information and otherwise to combat. And as uh, Mary was talking about the technology needs in this space to really ensure that a lot of that information is fact checked properly. When we provide the size of that, the size of the situation, we know that it enables um, many platforms to do something about it. One of the things that we're working on now uh, is with one of our tech incubator companies using AI to evaluate content real time and understand uh, on a scale from fake to not fake, if you will, 
uh, you know, where content uh, sits. We're doing that in a number of different ways. But what we do understand more importantly is that there's an opportunity, a space uh, uh, for Nielsen to have its voice in this space to help dispel some myths, but more importantly, to put data behind information that is being disseminated by platforms. Yeah, and, and this year, way, more than ever. Oh, um, I was just go gonna ahead, say, Mary. very, sorry, really, really quickly, there is a role for technology here too. I mean, the bad guys know technology really well, and it's a bit of a cat and mouse game always, but there is some really promising research in being able to identify uh, uh, the content, the provenance of content, where it has come from, and to be able be able to tell whether the content has been manipulated. This is so far mostly on the video realm, and I think we've got a lot of work to do to manage text and words and those sorts of things. But being able to identify manipulated content um, is important, but being able to identify it before it gets out there is even more important, and that's the really hard part. And Luz, be before we go on, I think it'd be useful I found it useful um, to sort of differentiate between disinformation and misinformation because one is disinformation, more of a deliberate attempt to deceive and manipulate um, content to do that for political purposes or even yes. as a business model, which has been incredibly profitable for many people. Yeah. Um, so, so there's there's where you see the foreign agents and and sort of a more organized effort to to use content, use information as a weapon, right? And then you have misinformation, which has to do more with, you know, this is not deliberate, this is the everyday mistakes that more traditional platforms can make um, in our news coverage, where there, it's, it's very interesting, I think, because that's what people should, where people should become more news literate. It'd be, it'd be ideal if we can start um, educating new generations on news literacy, because we gave everyone one of this, without uh, yeah. you know, a lot of instructions on how to use without it. Without a manual. <laughs> to more knowledge and information that Bill Clinton had when he was president of the United States just with a smartphone. And, and so it's yeah. incredibly powerful. And, and so what I mean by that is uh, more traditional news platforms, we uh, have standards, we are held accountable. We need to work on transparency. And as, as, you know, as, a, as someone, as a consumer, a news consumer, part of the audience, that's an advantage to you. We're doing all the fact checking. We're verifying the, the information, and and you should take a, advantage of that. Um, whereas you know where, where we have the opposite in, in this idea, this abstract idea of the media. You know, everyone mm -hmm. could be the media. Um, I'm a correspondent for 60 Minutes, a, a a program that's been on air for 54 years. I worked for 60 Minutes Plus, the streaming version of that. But you know, I'm part of the media. But also a guy who goes on YouTube right now and starts talking about what's happening at the border. He's also considered the media. So, uh, you know, I think there, that, that's the challenge to differentiate between deliberate, not deliberate, and, and, and see what accountability, standards, and transparency does in that environment. The difference with the guy on YouTube, though, is that he says he's not the media. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says that he doesn't like the media in many cases. So, you know, and I, I'm so glad we're talking about this because misinformation is everywhere. And we noticed how this year it really, it was the difference between life and death with COVID and the Latino community. So many people sharing misinformation on social media led many Latinos not to get vaccinated. Many people chose to just say, Dios me va a guardar, I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be protected. And then once they ended up in the ICU, it was too late to get vaccinated. So maybe let's talk about how, you know, the power of misinformation and how we're seeing it vividly happen in this, um, in this time, right? So how can members of the American media and the press combat this? Let's start with you, Stacey. I think how, um, I'd like to speak specifically to audiences, right? And I think Enrique really uh, hit the nail on the head when he said, he said news literacy, but in general, media literacy. And I know Mary has some to, con to contribute to this conversation as well, but that really feels to me like the first step. We This really needs to be a multi-pronged approach. So we need to you know, educate our communities and others about myths and disinformation. And thank you, Enrique, for that clarification, because I actually think there's a lot of misinformation about uh, vaccine efficacy, but more importantly, I think there's deliberate disinformation. And when it comes to the Latino yes. community, there is a long history, a long history of disinformation targeted specifically at our community 
for specific outcomes. And we can look no further than, you know, the election uh, uh, most recently. So uh, it's beyond misinformation, it's deliberate. Uh, so I, I think in uh, educating our own communities around the differences and around how to fact check and validate content. And then the other thing, as uh, Mary pointed out earlier, is really technology, ensuring that fact checking content moderation is uh, where it needs to be both in language uh, and of course in English. I think in language content moderation is one of the biggest challenges. And it's interesting because it doesn't seem that it should be at this point, yet it still is. Um, you know, there it you you can look no further, I think, than than music. And and you'll recall even just a few years ago, a lot of dialogue about around um music lyrics that were, you know, very common in in radio that many of us who speak Spanish recognize probably didn't have a place on the airway. So we are, um, there is a lot of work to be done here, but I know technology companies like Mary's, like Nielsen and others are stepping up to do our end, but I do think there's an opportunity uh, for the community and for us to encourage the community um, uh, to you know, in increase and improve media literacy and news literacy. And, and I, I guess, I guess how I do you tell, go, go for it, Mary. I, I was I was very gonna ask quickly. Quick. <laughs> go for it, go for it. <laughs> the lag is killing us here. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds. Oh no, it's the one second latency lag. It's a problem here. Yes. Um, I agree with everything Stacy said. And obviously, you know, media literacy is super important. And Enrique knows a lot about that topic as well. What I was going to say was that in some of the communities where we've done pilot programs, what we're seeing is that the, that the traditional media is actually the sharing stories with the newer digital upstarts. And, and some of those are Spanish speaking as well. So we've seen very specific examples in Fresno, California and in Yakima, where a story story written, for example, in the Yakima Herald is translated by our community organization and made available to El Sol, for example, a story in Fresno about vaccine hesitancy moving over and also being and being talked about on the local Spanish speaking radio station. So that kind of we've seen collaboration among these news cohorts and these pilot communities that that for me is just uh, it's just super optimistic to see it. That's great. Uh, and, and Bruce, if, if, if I may, I, I think uh, it's also important to, to know why our community is um, you know, particularly vulnerable to, to this post-truth or disinformation and misinformation environment. I think um, it has to do a lot with how we consume news now. So going back to our Absolutely. original um, uh, question, um, you know, as, as we move away from more traditional uh, platforms and and online where we see unfortunately these uh, conspiracy theories and unverified rumors and just false content uh, thriving and, and proliferating um, where we come from sometimes in my case I, I am a first generation immigrant from Mexico but I think there are other other examples where we come from countries where there is a natural distrust in traditional uh, media uh, in traditional sources of information, right, where there's not a lot of um, a clear difference between official information, state-owned uh, 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 you know, outlets, and the the privately owned companies that operate through the state. You know, there, we, we, there's all this uh, confusion about that. So, so that's why I think Latinos are specifically vulnerable. Some of the reasons why. We're specifically vulnerable to this misinformation and disinformation campaigns, and it had a a real cost in terms of our health and, and our lives uh, during the pandemic. We saw this infodemic, not just with the vaccines, but even before that, um, where we saw a lot of um, of the type of, of of rumors and 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 just unverified uh, information and content that led people to think that the virus wasn't real, that they didn't have to wear masks or socially distance and or take any sort of uh, of measures to protect themselves and their families um, even when they were taking things that were not you know medically recommended or approved uh, when they became uh, ill and just that just complicated their their um, you know th their health outcomes so uh, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that we are particularly vulnerable to that and work on those fronts to make sure that both politically in the next election, let's hope we don't experience another one, but the next health emergency, 
uh, we're better equipped and, 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 and can deal with this much better. And, and if I can add to what is, go for it, Stacey. Sorry, if I wanted to add to what Enrique said uh, in outlining um, uh, the, the really the primary reason why we're vulnerable, I wanted to add one more just for, for those that are listening that, uh, that might find it interesting. Um, so primary vulnerability, you, you talked about, um, you know, news and information um, from countries of origin. But the other is that, or, and the other, I should say, is that a lot of these platforms offer, um, offer a privacy and a place to exchange information and dialogue that isn't afforded in uh, a larger platform. So specifically, I'm talking about, um, you know, encrypted apps. I'm talking about Telegram. I'm talking about WhatsApp. You know, this is a, um, the privacy that these platforms offer. Uh, oftentimes are also the, it's it's one of the things that's most attractive to our community and we've been exposed uh, and had to to a lot of uh, a lot of dialogue around why privacy is so important to us. We, we know why that is, but that's one of the other things I think that's contributing to the larger use of some of these, you know, ancillary platforms and, and social in general. And then of course, um, uh, you know, disinformation agents specifically using those platforms for uh, for causes. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Enrique. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting. We started talking about the paywall and how people could access a certain type of news uh, outlets by paying a subscription, right? Mary, you mentioned some of that as well. And I think that also plays a role in how Latinos are getting the news. Is free to get your news on social media. It's free to get your news through your family and friends through WhatsApp. So, Enrique, this question is for you. How do you tell tu tía, tu, tu, tu familia, in Espanol, how do you tell them who to trust? Where do they go? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I think you earn trust. It's hard to, to point people in that direction. I, I, I failed miserably sometimes at that, um, you know, during the, the early months of the pandemic because I experienced H1N1 as a reporter in Mexico. I recognized fairly quickly what was happening and, and what the potential of what we were experiencing could be. And, and I reached out to the president of news at the network that I was working for and my family. And, and I mean, I try to do that in a, the same way that I approach news in general with, you know, context, with, with facts, um, not panicking or anything like that. And, and again, I failed miserably. My, own, my mom, you know, she unfortunately caught the virus early on and, and she, you know, was sick, uh, not seriously ill, but feeling pretty bad for a while. She's 72. Uh, so she wouldn't even listen to my advice or even believe in what I was saying. It's, it's extremely difficult to earn that trust. And, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to answer this question, Luz, because we've been talking about the responsibility of platforms and the responsibility of the audience, but we hardly talk about the responsibility of the media, you know, whatever that is, it's, it's a lot of things, but of journalists, of journalists like, like, like myself, we have to recognize that we have a level of responsibility in the in the uh, you know, crisis of confidence in the way we've lost uh, the, the the trust and 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 the connection with the audience in in this fragmentation and this hyperpolarization. We have to recognize we have a level of responsibility in that, and that's why I was you know uh, underlining the importance of not just changing and innovating the. Uh, formats and innovating through technology and, and, and business models, but also, uh, you know, the, the reckoning with the fact that we need a different approach. When I see, you know, how journalism is, and, and, and in my field in broadcast journalism, uh, how it's, it's, it's performed nowadays, I just see a field of flowers and almost every flower looks the same, right? I don't see any incentive to, to, to grab one or the other. Everyone's repeating themselves. We, we, use the same images, we use the same type of coverage. It's sort of a, 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 a vicious cycle. And, and I just think we, we need to redefine what, what the role of, of journalists and, and enlarged uh, of the media is in this new reality, in this new media environment. Um, and, and, and go back to the principles of journalism, the most traditional principles of journalism, not in this false idea of objectivity and false balance, but of, uh, as a service and, uh, you know, as, as, as a force to seek truth and, and promote public dialogue. So, but if I also Luz, think could I people are, yeah, Luz, um, could I that's fine. I was, yeah, absolutely. But I was just also going to mention that do you also believe that 
people are you know having this reaction because that's what they're watching on social media right like news outlets want to be the first so everybody is getting the same wire they're getting the same photos and they're posting it because they want to be first but being first doesn't mean you're actually as accurate as you can be go ahead mary yeah, thanks. And Enrique, I think you're being a little bit hard on yourself and, and journalists. Um, uh, <laughs> well, let me let me actually pose a different a different kind of a theory. Um, and it is true that everybody these days can call themselves a journalist. But um, one of the reasons we think that there's been a rise so much in these in these new uh, media outlets and Instagrams is because there's been a dearth in in news reporting. The number of newspaper so this is not broadcast, but newspaper reporters has halved in the last 10 years. We are seeing more and more of what are called news deserts where entire counties don't have a local newspaper. That doesn't mean there's not a local radio station, but the fact of the matter is that the news media is has been in a financial decline. There are lots of reasons for that. I might argue that the advertising revenue decline creates a responsibility for tech companies to provide a little bit more support. But, I, but when you see decline in the kinds of journalists that, Luce, you are, and Enrique, that you are, broadly, with staffs being cut, legal budgets being cut, people being sometimes afraid to take on a story because of the backlash from litigation, and then you see kind of with impunity the Instagram post, you know, we really know that we need to shore up the kinds of journalists and the kind of reporters that the two of you are. Very fascinating. And also, you know, now that you're bringing in the legal aspect, there's also something called cancel culture. So as journalists, many are scared of cancel culture, of saying something, reporting something that could lead to everyone around you attacking you. So what do you say, Mary? How should journalists deal with that? Well, um, boy, I can't speak for how you all answer that. What I can say, though, is that I'm really proud of a small program that we, a pro bono legal program that we've recently developed at Microsoft with the law firm Davis Wright Tremaine and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. And it provides pro bono journalists who, um, legal support who are working on three discrete areas where we think that we can, we can have volunteer lawyers uh, help. And that, those are um, FOIA requests, pre-publication review, and um, um, it's based on the last one. I must be late afternoon. But the but the thing is, <laughs> the thing is that we are really excited that this program can grow, and we're really looking with our, uh, the RCFP and others to grow this. We had a training program for Microsoft lawyers. 80 lawyers showed up to learn about it, to take on pro bono cases, to support journalists who otherwise could not afford legal fees. That's amazing. Thank you, Mary. Okay, now let's go to the next question. And I think we've kind of talked about this a little bit, about how has the digital world transformed journalism? And Stacy, maybe you can talk about, you know, the question that I asked Enrique, who should people trust? And what are some tips that you can give everyone who's watching this as to what they should keep in mind before they're ingesting news today? Uh, one thing that and I, I'll actually turn it over to to Enrique to talk about, you know, tips about ingesting news. But one thing that I, I will say is we have seen that information largely is um, ha has really disseminated to a lot of other platforms aside from traditional television. I was just looking at some data today right before this call and looking at where people are increasingly consuming not just news, but content in general. And there are, you know, certainly streaming platforms, digital, other digital and social platforms and messaging apps. So as, you know, as I think as journalists, and, and I'm not speaking for journalists, but speaking um, what I think journalists might say, as journalists, it's really thinking also about how and where we extend uh, our trusted persona. We opened this session with Enrique talking a little bit about using, you know, this this very um, very thorough and thought through position of how he uses his social dialogue, his social network uh, with people that follow him, and and the responsibility that comes with being a journalist even outside of social, right? And so using that platform to extend a very central position around. Um, what is happening at the border and not um, contributing to border hysteria. So what I think is increasingly important is as we look to, uh, you know, uh, journalists, that journalists also recognize their responsibility is beyond the content they're producing for a segment or for an article, but really in 
uh, in bringing forward that narrative narrative of, of trust and thoughtful central information and all the other platforms that they uh, extend their, their knowledge because their audiences, people consuming that content and sharing it extend beyond you know, that segment, those that are being reached specifically by that one segment. Uh, and Luz, to answer your question in a very practical way, I would encourage people to approach news and information as they do food. Um, we know what kind of food has nutritional value. We can see the labels in the back and you know, we know that sometimes uh, fast food or junk food is satisfying and e easily accessible and you know, it's marketed in a way that, that looks great and you know, you can always just have it in, in, in minutes. It's, it's not, uh, you know, expensive, it's very cheap, but we know that it has no nutritional value and that if we only, you know, have, have junk food, we'll probably end up with serious health problems. Well, you're also feeding your brain and, and your emotional health and your, your mental uh, well-being with the information you're consuming and the conversations you're having. Uh, so, so be as mindful of, of what you're putting in your mind and, and how you're consuming that information, how it makes you feel. Sometimes you, so, you see something like a picture of a Border Patrol agent on a horse and you want to react and you feel frustrated and angry. But question more, uh, demand more from your news sources. Look for in-depth coverage for context. Um, ask them to be transparent about how they gather that information. Look for, uh, for trusted sources of information, not just the ones that agree with your point of view. Uh, and keep challenging yourself to, to, to go deeper and deeper. So, sometimes my own family sends me links of, you know, this incredible conspiracy theories and stuff like that on, on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. and, and instead of reacting negatively to that, I'm just saying, how can you send me, you know, you're, you're my uncle, you're my wife, and you're sending, you're sending me this. I mean, you should have known better by now. I always tell them, do you know what's the source? Have you actually read the, the entire article? Does it say what, it's, what, it, what it says it says? Have you looked for additional sources of information? And that always ends well. May, may I Thank add, so much. Enrique, to your point? May I add, we have 30 seconds recently. left. <laughs> we have 30 seconds left in this panel, but go ahead, Stacey. But I, I was. I, may I add that New, at Nielsen, we just took a look at the top 100 news publications and digital news web, uh, digital news publications, and more than three quarters of the of the the fake news or um, fake to moderately fake news content was concentrated outside of the top 25. So to your okay. point, you you started early with saying, "What does your diet look like? Where you can where you can know you know you know what's fact checked and nutritional content." A lot of that news is concentrated on on tiny sites, but unfortunately, um, you know, get spread. Okay, this has been amazing. Uh, we ran out of time, but before we go, I do want you guys all to have an opportunity to maybe um, have some closing remarks, but instead of actually saying something that's going to be a minute long, I'm gonna ask you, maybe you can say one word that our audience here can keep in mind when digesting news. Go ahead, Mary. Verify. Enrique? I would say question. Keep questioning the sources of information you consume. Keep questioning your own bias. Keep questioning, you know, and, and that is going to lead you to better answers and a better experience as a news consumer. Stacy? Responsibility. Great. Okay, so I'm being told this is so good that we're getting more time. This is like going overtime in a soccer game. I love this. <laughs> okay, so let's move into Penalty several geeks. questions that we got. Penalty geeks. I know, I know. Well, good job on thinking on your feet with those words. I love them all. Okay, so these are some questions that we're getting from our audience. One of them says, how can Latinos be better allies to Black, Asians, and Indigenous communities in building a more just and equitable nation? Mary? Oh, that is a big question. And I think if I knew the answer to that, I could be president of the United States or something. Um, <laughs> let me just, um, you know, sort of really, I'm not going to talk, I'm not wearing my journalism hat now. I've, you know, had a, a long career at Microsoft and I've done a lot in the communities, um, in, in the Seattle community too. And, you know, I think 
you know, the questions, race and social justice questions that we are facing today, we are at an inflection point. But I think that every person is, a, is on their own individual journey. And I would just, you know, as I am, I would just encourage all of us to begin that journey, however you feel most comfortable, but to test yourself enough that you feel uncomfortable so that you're testing new ideas and understand that what where you are going with your friends and neighbors who are Asian, who are Latino, who are African-American, who are Indian, everyone comes with a different culture, but probably has the same core values. And take some time to educate yourself not necessarily, I mean, yes, you're going to have the same family values, but take some time to educate yourself about the history and the legacy of the people who are your neighbors so that you can better understand how they're feeling to be empathetic and to go on a journey that is a long-term journey, but is together. Okay, that's good. Now, here's another question that I find very interesting. Misinformation happens on MSM all the time. So who fact? Who fact checks them? Go for it, Enrique. Do you have any idea? I mean, um, you know, I, I think that's that's where the individual responsibility comes in, and and the questioning and the the responsibility, um, the, the the verifying that that we summarized in in each word uh, that we said at the end. Um, I, I think, again, yes, it's great that. It, there's this democratization of information. It's great that uh, traditional platforms don't monopolize news and information like they used to do, and that everyone is part of that conversation and that process. But that also comes with a responsibility to be better consumers of information, um, to be more media literate. I'm going to stop saying news literate and change to media literate, like Stacy uh, uh, teached me today. Um, I, I think I think that's how it happens. We cannot limit or stop. Um, you know, these this forms of communication that go beyond the, the traditional arena of, of where we were interacting. Uh, uh, we've seen that during the pandemic more than ever. Uh, but we can, uh, I, I guess, regulate that uh, on a more individual basis. Uh, just, just whenever someone shares something with you, just, you know, uh, ask them, where, where did you get this from? Did you read it yourself? What does it say? Just I think those are very simple questions and and it doesn't put anyone on the defensive. It's not like you're trying to, to offend them. It's just you're you're being responsible in the way you consume news. Just as if I gave you something to it, it's like who did you did you make this yourself? You know, um, what did you put in it? Uh, is it super spicy? <laughs> uh, just which is a question I often get. I, you know um, that's such a good way to say it. I'm thinking like if I were, you know, for, for example, if I had a, a dietary, you know, um, a dietary concern or I couldn't have gluten, gluten or I was vegan, I would ask someone when I was served something, <laughs> is something in it that's so true. So I, I, you know, but it's interesting because we don't do that in news, but that's really what and Big has been talking about. It's like, really treat this like it is your information diet and you, you, you owe it to yourself and to the other person to know what is what's in what's within this. Is it going to make you, you know, quite literally sick? Yeah. Do you think I mean, it's possible because people during the last uh, during the last um, uh, presidential election where, you know, everybody was kind of like, Defensivo, you know, defensive, right? Because yeah, they were, you know, I can't tell you who I who I'm gonna vote for. I can't tell you who I'm not gonna vote for, right? So it kind of creates this this sort of like bubble of who you can bring in, right? So Mary, maybe you can speak on that as to um how to create a community, right? Of where anyone can ask any sort of questions and even just you know question whatever it is that they're getting, any news that they're getting from their family members. Yeah, well, I'm going to go back to talk about this pilot in Fresno, California, because I think it's really a great example. The the mayor, um, uh, former mayor of Fresno, Ashley Swearingen, now leads the community foundation there. And that population is heavily Latino. And she was seeing polar mm -hmm. as mayor polarization in the city. And she really, when she went to the community foundation after her term as mayor, really decided to focus on journalism and storytelling in the community by people who weren't necessarily journalists, but storytellers as a way to bring the community together. And so she's created a particular fund with community donations to help support media broadly, nonprofit, for-profit, 
um, radio, television, um, to tell the stories of the community. And she's created storytelling kinds of podcasts from you know people in the community. So it's really using the media as a celebration of the community and the community coming together. And of course, that doesn't happen overnight. I guess I go back to my journey kind of analogy. But um, I think um, that is one example of a city in progress and a community foundation and a former mayor doing some great work. Uh, I'm getting a question my, here uh, for you. Sorry, my own Go personal it, experience, really, really quickly, Luz, and I, I, I hate to, to put that personal experience in the middle of a, a conversation like this, but um, for a while there, I was going on, on Fox News very often on uh, Tucker Carlson's show and, and other uh, shows um, to talk about you know issues that, that uh, were important to, I think, uh, Latinos in general. Um, Latinx people here in the U.S. and and I did that um, against the advice of many friends and and family uh, because I thought I was going to make a difference. Again, going back to what Joaquin Castro was saying, uh, to provide a, a a a Latino narrative or at least you not know, Latino, a Mexican immigrant narrative, uh, experiencing life in the U.S. during the the the, the um, you know the early years of the of the Trump uh, presidency. Um, and, and I had the good intention of sort of trying to reach middle ground and at least if I could just get a, a, different, a different narrative out there, a different version of what was happening with immigration, with, uh, with issues that, that, that were relevant at the moment. And um, I, I don't know if I did. Uh, it's, it's not so much because I, I wasn't an effective uh, messenger for that as much as it was that they that platform was not interested in that. They were just interested in, in this idea of provocation and 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 you know uh, having things out of context and and attacking and, and and thriving on that division that we that we've seen on that partisanship that we've seen. Uh, but uh, you know, at least you have to reach out. You you have to make an effort to do that uh, and and not do that in a way that offends people and. And try to sort of uh, undermine their experience and 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 their uh, ideology, their political preferences. Uh, I think you just have to reach out uh, for the sake of of of, you know, of of dialogue, of debate, and 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 thinking that's how democracy works, right? When when we can have uh, conversations, even if we don't agree on 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 the things we're talking about. Yeah, I think the problem is we don't agree on the facts, you know, and you're, you're exactly right, Enrique, that it's really hard when we, we don't agree on the facts. And again, yeah. the role of journalists like you in, yes, I know you bring compassion and empathy, but you also bring facts. Absolutely. Yeah. Stacy, maybe if you can share the final thoughts you would like our audience to take today. Um, one thing I, I wanted to add from our discussion earlier on was um, there was a question that came in around um, how we can be better allies uh, throughout the you know diverse other diverse communities. And I think one thing that we can do, and I'll, I'll circle this back to news, is recognize our own ethnic plurality. You know, as Latinos, we are Black, we are Asian, uh, we are Middle Eastern. We have a um, you know a um, a, a diaspora of, uh, of, you know, representation within our community, and I think the more um, we we link arms with the rest of our community, the better we can be and will be. I wanted to add that, and then I think um, back to what um, Joaquin Castro said earlier. He he said specifically in his intro, uh, image defining narratives, and we focused a lot today on news, and um, and rightfully so, news and journalism, but I also think you know, greater the media has a responsibility to ensure that we are seen, Latinos and the Latino diaspora, Afro-Latinidad, all of it, it we are seen um, really not only, uh, you know, in news and telling stories from our unique perspectives, but also generally speaking throughout content uh, where, where folks outside of our community develop their perceptions of us based on how we're presented in content. So we have a, a big responsibility, all of us, those of us throughout media, both in news, in distribution and content development, writers and producers, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think there has never been a better time. The light is on our community. 
our ethnic plurality, uh, plurality is really being um, exposed and it's giving us all an opportunity to step forward and into the light. And to complement that, I know we have 20 seconds, Luz, uh, there was a report today, actually, uh, you know, uh, Joaquin Castro presented a report today by the uh, Government Accountability Office where it says that 80% of media executives, and this includes film, television, um, news, and publishing, are white, and only 4% are Latino. That's that's a, a you know striking disparity. Also, we are around 19, 20% of the U.S. population, but only uh, I think it was around 12% of of the jobs in media, film, television, news, publishing. So that's important. Representation matters. Mary, do you want to say your final thoughts? And Enrique, I don't know if that's what you want your final thought to be. So I can circle back with matters. you. Mary. It's always a good way to end the conversation. <laughs> well. <laughs> And I know we've got about two and a half minutes left, and so I'll be um, judicious with the time here. First of all, I just want, Luis, I want to thank you. Um, not many of the questions were ones I expected, but that's okay. I think that's part of the um, <laughs> journal is we just yeah. keep going. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I, I, I want to close with just two things. Um, first of all, to really emphasize what Enrique and Representative Castro said about the importance of, of diversity and race and social justice in this particular industry. It's an issue across many industries, as you know, but, uh, but as Enrique just really um, said so strongly, it's, 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 if not more important here, I don't know where it would be more important. And so what, whatever we can do to help change that representation. And again, some of the work being done at the federal level, the Local Journalism Sustainability Act seeks to put more people in newsrooms who are more representative. Report for America, another great nonprofit doing some really good work in this area too. So I wholeheartedly agree with Enrique. Um, let me just close by saying that I hope you all take a look at um, just search Microsoft uh, Protecting Journalism to get an idea of some of the broad work that we are doing in this area. It is not transactional. It is something we want to do on a sustained basis with partners. And we view all of you as our partners. Mary, where can people find you on social media? The same question for Enrique and Stacy to keep this conversation going. Uh, Twitter, Mary E. Snap. Um, I'm at Enrique underscore Acevedo uh, in, in everywhere but, but TikTok because I just don't know how to dance. Oh, that's funny. LinkedIn too. I'm old school. LinkedIn, put, find me on LinkedIn. And I'm, I'm, I'm at Stacy Stacy de Armas on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And uh, also Nielsen, you can uh, Google uh, Nielsen representation in media and see some of the work that we're doing in that space. We'd love to hear from anyone that wants to dialogue further about it. Amazing. I want to thank you guys for being great panelists and for this thoughtful conversation that we had today. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Mary. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. And keep tweeting with the hashtag CHCIHHM21.